Can you hear me? I, I know some of you can't see me, but that, that's rather unfortunate. <laughs> I mean, anyway, I wouldn't do. Anyway, so thank you for invitation and thank you for having us here. We're really thrilled. It's my first time to be in a kind of industry-minded conference, and then let's see how it goes. Yeah. Thank you. That helps a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So I'm Coco, a researcher in Kyoto University, and I'm currently finishing up my PhD in Birmingham in the UK. And then I'm with Steven, also from Birmingham, and then we're working with Dan Giga as well. So let me start with this question. What happens if you have to run a program by hand, not no relying on your runtime? So think about this program. I wrote a, the same program in different languages. So this is essentially a um, program that gives you back the identity function. So um, channel your inner OCaml and Haskell and you see how it will run in your mind. Yeah, you see the process. So let's look at the OCaml one first. So in OCaml, because we use the call by value evaluation, whenever we see a function applied to something, an argument, we have to make sure that the argument is evaluated before we apply any function on it. So when we see this program, this function part is not a value yet, it's another function application, so we, re so we evaluated it, evaluate it first down to an identity function before we can actually evaluate this function that throws an argument away. So, so this is how OCaml evaluation would go. It's a, yeah, so you, the point is you have to look at the argument before apply any function. On the other hand, in Haskell, Haskell is kind of smarter in the sense that they look at the function first and they say that, oh, this doesn't use an argument, so no need for looking at an argument, just throw it away. So get the result in one step straight away. So the point is, like different languages have different evaluation strategies. They may, in different, in different strategies, you may get the same result out of a single program, but the process, when you look at the process, closely, and then actually different things are going on. So can you see the process? And then when you, when you have to run your program, then you have a certain way to read a program that, that kind of corresponds to an evaluation strategy you use. So let's introduce a bit of formality to this process of running a program. So instead of just kind of reading a program, thinking about which one to see first. We decorate a program with something called focus, which is a highlighting of a part of a program. And then running a program is now given us change of configurations, a pair of a program and a highlighting. So in this OCaml function case, the initial configuration is always like this. The focus is over the whole program. So we start from the whole program and then in OCaml, we do call by value evaluation. So the focus in the next step moves on to the argument, which is not a value yet. And then, and then from now on, everything we do is limited within the focus. So we kind of forget about anything outside the focus. And then we look at this part only. And then here we have a function applied to a value. So then that's fine, we can apply perform this application and then get, fun get the identity function that takes set and returns set. So this focus is kind of done. It only highlights a value. So this time we expand the focus, namely back to the whole program. So now we can see the outer application and then it can be performed because the argument is now a value. So then finally we can throw the argument away and get um, the identity function. Sorry, there's a typo. This one shouldn't be here. My apologies. Whereas in Haskell, 
So the difference is going to be the way we move the focus, or the focus actually moves. But the initial configuration is always the same. We start from the whole program. And then now in core by need or lazy evaluation, the focus doesn't go to a function argument. So it only looks at the function, and they see an argument is going to be thrown away. So we get this by in one step. So, so here the point is the formality is not very, it doesn't bring you very far from your intuition. That's, that's one point. So we just um, introduce a highlighting of a part of a program, which I call focus. And then the focus, the, the way the focus moves determines or represents an evaluation strategy you use. And then every evaluation process should ha or, or always happen inside a focus. And then there's some goodness of formality. It's not just about making clear how you run a program, but formality also enables us to answer some questions like this. Like, when are two programs the same? Or how much cost? It t how much time or space does it take to run a program? Or does a compiler actually work as we expect? And then, Especially the first one is crucial to have a safe compiler optimization. And then, but these questions all contain some informality. And then to answer these questions, we need to make it clear that what, it mean, what we mean by the same or the time and space cost or the expectation of the behavior. And the formality is what we need to answer all these questions. And then by introducing the focus moving around the program, we can kind of Attack, uh, tackle these questions. Like, um, so to, to answer this question, we have to formalize what is the answer of a program. And that, that is given by both the final configuration you get and also some change that you can observe. So think about a program that has input and output feature. And then the result should contain anything that program puts on the output stream. As, as well as the final results the program, uh, program produces. So we need to think about observable change on configurations, but then by having this configuration and change, we can formalize these notions. And similarly, for the time and space cost, we can count the number of change we need to run a program. Then also we can estimate the cost of each change on the configuration. And for the space cost, it amounts to think of a size of a configuration. And then also here, the, like a conventional usual way to go is to think about this focus moving around and then, and then describe this process of moving a focus as an abstract machine, like a state machine. And then try to derive a compiler <coughs> sorry, from that formalization. So there's some goodness and then this is one of many things that happen in the research community of function programming, I guess. Now, we've seen some goodies of formalities, and then it's time to go to our, like, our field. So now we, so our proposal is to do this formality with diagrams, not just textual representation of programs, not just strings. So, but we don't change a lot of things. We still see a program as change of configuration, but we, but we replace configuration with a diagram configuration, where a program is represented by a diagram, and the focus, which was, which is a highlighting of a part of a program, is now replaced with something called a token, which you can think of as a marking of a diagram. So, here comes, comes some demos. So Stephen and I implemented a visualizer of how this, hang on. Yeah. Yes. Probably, so I put this here. So then, so this is uh, our visualizer, and then on the left, you can type in any lambda terms, not, 
constants like one or two, but any lambda terms untyped you can type in. And then for example here, I can type the program that we've seen before. Lambda w, x, x, dot. And then you have a choice of your evaluation strategies. Let's say call by value. And then you get a diagram. So a diagram is like a syntax tree with some decorations. So you can see some nodes like this application nodes are for function application and then lambda nodes are for lambda abstraction of function. So you read this diagram bottom up. So the bottom lambda application is for the top level application. And then the left arm goes to the function part and the right arm goes to an application part. So on the function part, let's ignore these things for now. We get a lambda function lambda node, which is for lambda w. And then because w is not used inside, so it's kind of discarded by a node with nowhere to go. And then, so the left arm of a lambda node is for bound variables or an argument variable. And then the right arm is for the body of the function. So in this case, the body goes on to lambda x dot x, and then the variable is represented simply by a wire. So you don't see a spe specific node, and then lambda x dot x, it's gonna, it becomes just a loop around the lambda node. And then you see the same structure for lambda y dot y and lambda z dot z. So one, one thing good about a diagram is that it forgets about the specific name of a variable. So lambda x dot x, y dot y, z dot z, all, go, all are represented by the same diagram. So it's name free, and then now, about these decorations. So there are some dashed boxes, and then they, they, are in, they indicate a function part. So each lambda abstraction is put inside a box. So this box is for lambda w dot lambda x dot x. And then all the other exclamation nodes and D nodes for our helpers for us to manipulate these dashed boxes. So, and then by using here, we can run this program and then we can see how it goes. So now, so the bottom line, bottom wire, which is like the input of the whole function or whole, whole program is colored red. I hope you can see. So this is where the token is or the new focus is. So the focus used to indicate a part of a program, but now it's just a marking in a diagram, a marking of a wire in the diagram. And then this, at this stage, the focus indicates or points to the whole program. And then now we are doing right to left call by value, like in OCaml. So that means the focus moves on to the argument part. Hang on, come on. Oh, this is unfortunate. Oh, that's sad. Give me a moment and think about that. Really? Try that again. Now, well, it looks like it doesn't run, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sad. Maybe if you can try in your laptop, if that works, that's fabulous. So then the point is, so then we, we saw, okay, let me describe. We saw a red wire, which is the focus. And then that now moves around the diagram, like we read a, like we read a program. So in this call by value case, here comes a nicer version, I guess. <laughs> 
So in this global value case, we especially we're now saying right to left call by value, which means whenever the token hits a function application, it always proceeds to an argument part, so that a fun so that a fun so that an argument is evaluated first before function application is actually performed. So the token goes to the top, to, goes to the right hand right hand side, and then it hits another lambda application. So it's gonna move right again. See the lambda. That means there's nothing to do. So the token comes back. Yeah. Oh wow. So the token comes back. Now the token visits just to make sure the left hand side is indeed a function value. And then in this case, yes, we've got lambda y dot y applied to lambda dot z. So the token happily returns. And then a function application means eliminating these nodes and then rewiring. So you will get this. And then now this is lambda z dot z. And then the whole function is awaiting for this argument. So the token travels along, around, coming back, we're going to this function part to see the lambda, and then the same thing happens again. Function is applied, and then you get the result. So the left loop is for lambda x dot x, and then the lambda z dot z is discarded. It becomes a garbage. And then you can literally see garbage is garbage because it's, it's not connected. It's going to be never visited by the token. So then this is the final configuration with the token at the bottom. It's gone, actually. Thank you very much for the help. <laughs> All right. Actually, can I try another example or not? No, actually. So then. <laughs> So that one is to Stevens wants for so the one you we've just seen that nicely colored one is Stevens visualizer with a bit of extension to the lambda calculus and the mine is for pure lambda calculus and then it actually supports several evaluation strategies I have no idea why it doesn't work I have to look at it so you can you can try different strategies, especially there's a strict distinction between left to right and right to left because we, we shouldn't confuse the token. So give it a try and then see if it actually works. So now we need to talk about goodness of diagrams, what they bring to us. So the first thing is it's name free. So any specific name of variables are kind of forgotten in a diagram, and then it's just represented by connection of wires. So that lambda x dot x and lambda y dot y are literally the same diagram. And then also, um, when, we, when actually a program is run, what happens is program is kind of ripped off, and then you keep focusing on a code, and then building up a data like an environment, what computation is assigned to a variable. And that environment is, in this case, all represented in a single diagram. So the whole program just changes, and then you don't split it into two different like, data structures. And then that makes life easier for at least people who want to analyze programs or reason about programs. And then, then also, diagrams, diagrams are quite visual, so you can like, intuitively see some interesting properties. So you can compare different evaluation strategies and then how one is more efficient in some cases, how, is, how the other is more efficient in other cases. And then, especially in call by need lazy evaluation that Haskell uses, it's quite important to share the intermediate results, right? A function application is evaluated only on demand, but once it's evaluated, the result is stored, memorization and then it's gonna be reused. And then that you can see in the diagram. And then in this case, stored doesn't mean it goes off a diagram. It still stays in a diagram. But then, but then the intermediate result is shared via, via a node with, with more wires connecting. And then, and then it's gonna be duplicated as, it, as demanded. Also, because this visualizer is for, is for untyped lambda calculus, you can throw in different Y combinators and then see how basically your laptop warms up. 
because of divergence. But then there are different patterns of divergence. Like this one, when you run this tiny program, you will get a really repeated pattern of evaluation. So it never, it never ends, but then you see a pattern. Whereas it, here, this program will grow forever. And then you can really see the diagrams grows, and then your laptop is getting hot. And also, so this is how diagrams help us understand what's going on in programs. And then we're not forgetting the conventional goodness of formality. So we are still, we can still answer, try to give an answer to all these questions, but with diagrams. And then actually using diagrams and using the token moving around gives us a new perspective on, on, the, on answering these questions. So for example, when we want to think when two programs are the same, we still have to look at the final configuration, like the final diagram we get when the token comes back, and then we have to think about observable change in this diagram configuration as well. But then we can kind of detect where two programs differ from each other. So it's gonna be given by a part of a diagram, and then the token we're gonna the token may or may not visit this difference. And then if the token never visits a different part of two programs, we are fine, we will get the same result. So we can, we can kind of have a different reasoning from a conventional approaches. And then here comes more goodness of diagrams. And then, so there are at least we can offer two, or we, can, we, we are thinking about two. And then one is the interplay between textual and visual diagrammatic representation of programs. And the other one is, let's say, is to guide language design. So there are some emerging programming paradigms which are quite like, which go well with graphs and diagrams. And then there are some libraries used commonly. But then we have this formal, formal model of running a program using diagrams. So why not capturing this new paradigms with diagrams and the tokens. And that's what Steven gonna talk about in the second half of this talk. So I'm concentrating on this part. So the slogan is, we'd like not just text or not just diagram, but both. Because just diagram will suck. It's gonna take time. So we now know how to turn a texture program into a diagram. So that's how we that's how we do the modeling of program, program run. But then we don't quite know yet how to bring this diagram back to the texture program. And then the reason is that a texture program is written within a certain grammar, and the grammar is made quite clear. But where, well, where is this program, a diagrammatic way of representing a program, all the vocabulary we've got is like nodes, edges, boxes, wires, so it's quite flat. And then these dashed boxes give some added, uh, added structure to it, but that's quite pretty much all. And then to bring a diagram safely back to a program, we need to figure out what kind of shape a diagram should have. And then that's that's called something called validity or correctness criteria. And then we need to find, figure out clearly so that we can bring it back. And also, so if we can have this way, the other way, so the way from diagrams to text, then that means we, we should be able to edit a program by tweaking a diagram. Not just by editing a text, but by tweaking a diagram. And then I, we, we think it would be really nice to have a diagram editor for program, like having a texture program and a diagram program side by side, and then we can edit text as usual, and then the diagram should automatically change. But at the same time, if we want to modify the diagram, the text part should change accordingly. And then we're dreaming of that, but because we haven't got a validity criteria yet, we haven't got it, but it would be really nice. And then I think we need the help from you here, guys, to make this happen. And then, as I show you, well, show you, so there is a way to formally run texture program, and then we've got a way to formally run a 
program with yeah, program represented by diagrams. So we're fine with execute with running a program. And then the point I want to make is to is about this debugging. So with diagrams, we think we may be able to have a good, nice, intuitive debugging tool. And then we've actually got it. So Jack Hughes is a, was a student in student in University of Birmingham, and then he drastically improved Stephen and I mind Stevens and mind visualizer, and then turned it into an OCaml visual debugger. So it is for subset of OCaml. It supports a range of language features, not yet pattern matching. And also, it's got a nice real features of debuggers. So you can, of course, see diagrams. And then you can go forwards as well as backwards, pause and resume. And then you can say, uh, you can say take, take, like, take 100 steps and then show me what happens. Also, you can set a breakpoint on diagram. Rather than, set up, rather than setting a breakpoint on a line of your code, text code, you can set a breakpoint on a node of a diagram. And then say, when the token hits this node, stop it. And then also this visualizer debugger shows you stats, saying how many steps the token moves, how many nodes were there during, during program run, and then so on. And then Dan made a really fun out of this and then posted some videos on YouTube which I show you quickly some of them. So then it's, it's gonna be useful for debugging and also it's useful to see how your program actually runs. So then the first one, I will show you this. Sorting comparison, no, not you. So the point is, we've got range of sorting algorithms, and then they come with asymptotic complexities, time cost, and then some have like n squares given a list of size n, and some has an asymptotic cost of n log n. And then we know some algorithms are faster than the others in terms of asymptotic complexity. So then here comes merge sort and insert sort. And then we know merge sort is faster, right? Asymptotically. So we run, we wrote a program and then give it to our OCaml visual debugger and they see what happens. And then it goes like this. So then you can kind of see this red thing going around and this is the token. And then this is basically the list with elements and cons connected. And then sometimes you see a drastic grow of a diagram because of duplicating or expanding a function. And then, I will skip to somewhere around. So remember, merge sort is on the left hand side, insert sort is on the right hand side. And here we go at, at like two minutes 20. And then we still, the right hand side, we're like getting, diagram is getting maybe smaller. And then let's see how it happens. So probably a few, a more like 20 seconds. <laughs> so on the right hand side, it's still like getting boom. But it's like getting there actually. So we've got elements like empty list, elements, 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 and cons. So now what happens is insert sort finished faster than merge sort. Well, that happens. So <laughs> asymptotically, merge sort may be faster, but then it's, it's just asymptotically. So when input list is small or your implementation is bad, then something counterintuitive or counter theoretic. No, it's not counter theoretic, but this thing happens. So insert sort finished at three, three minutes, after three minutes, and then this video is for six minutes, 48 seconds. That means much thought is gonna go on for the last three minutes. So the point is you can see, and then by the way, this is really like, um, this doesn't show the real speed. 
This is speeded up. So if you run it on your laptop, it's going to take hours, probably. So you can see, so the point is you can see it. And then also, the, the, the size of diagrams or the number of nodes is something that you can also see. So you can test kind of, you, you can try your program and then see what goes on. And then here's another one. And then this is a comparison between the same, um, between two functions of the same result, one written in ten recursive way, one written in non ten recursive way. And then you can, again, run it to see. And then it starts, it starts similarly, right? And then now because the function is expanded, you will start to see the difference. And then I will just go forward, go forward. And then here you can start to see the difference. Can you guess which one is tail recursive and which one is not? Well, this the video said it already. So the answer I guess is the right one is tail recursive because on the left, on the left, you can see some computation weighting, like plus one or something. And then as as a program run proceeds, the stock is gonna get bigger. Yeah. So for example here, you can see there's nothing waiting for the computation, whereas on the left hand side, now we've got a stack of two computations that's gonna be added at the end. So you can enjoy your visual debugger and see. So it supports list and recursion, so you can try your list computations. So going back to the slides. So, so what we got is a, is a debugger, first things first. It's a debugger, so it's got nice features. At the same time, you can see some interesting, like let's say, phenomena of programs. So what I've shown you is how we use diagrams to model a program run. It's not too far away from what we do if we have to run a program by hand. It's, it's basically the change of re representation. And then we can we represent the program as a diagram, and then, then running a program means moving the token around, and then perform some diagram rewriting around the token. So it's all controlled by the token. The token rules them all. And then, so we can use it to answer, like classic, answer some classic questions about programs, like when two programs are considered to be the same, as well as try thinking about this nice usage of diagram modeling. And then I've shown you an OCAM visual debugger, and then we really think it would be nice to have a nice interplay between text representation and diagram representation. And then we are literally halfway through, and then we need to get through the way from diagram to text and then diagram editing. And then if you're interested, work to, let's work together on it. And then the rest of the talk will be given by Steven on this thing. And then I don't mean this is a dark side, but it's gonna be a new horizon, new thing for you. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, cool. So, um, thank you for Coco for the transit to my dark theme. And, uh, right. So, so far you have uh, seen what the diagrammatic semantic is and how it actually works. So, in the second half, I'm going to talk about some applications of the diagrammatic semantics. So, I'm going to pick up the pace a bit. So, <laughs> it's fine. So, um, before talking about the applications, I'm going to extend the lambda calculus with some constants first. So on the right-hand side is a very simple uh, diagram for the program. And the purple nodes corresponds to the constants and operations. And then everything else are just uh, what Coco have said before. 
and let's actually see the execution step by step. So the, uh, the token always starts from the bottom. And then in this line, we are going to evaluate the value of x. And then we're just searching for the redact. And this step, we're eliminating, eliminating uh, the box structure, uh, which means that we are going to use the computation that hide behind the, uh, the, the, the function. And then the next step is just the beta reduction. And now we're going to evaluate y. And when it hits the constant boxes, this is like asking what is the value of x. And then the box will be copied in this way. And this is like the substitution in lambda calculus. And then we do similar things. And then 1 plus 1 is going to be rewritten to 2. And then we're just going to return the value of y. So during the execution, you can kind of see the uh, data flow information in the program. So if you think of x as the input to a data flow graph, then y is simply the dependence, uh, to, the dependence to x. But this kind of information will be lost during the execution because of the copying of uh, the variable, uh, variable x and also the rewrite of the plus node. So what we can do is to preserve this data flow information by tweaking the rules a bit. And uh, we're going to see that in a minute. And what I want to say is that this kind of diagrammatic semantics is a perfect match to these kind of languages with a data flow graph in it. So for example, a spreadsheet is a very classic uh, example of a data flow language. So in a spreadsheet, you can create cells, and then you can create a dependency of the cells. And more recently, computational graph also uh, has it effects on machine learning as well. So this is highly uh, due to the language TensorFlow. So in TensorFlow, you can kind of construct this kind of computation graph. And then when you want to train the uh, model, you can just run the graph with a training set. And then you can uh, calculate the gradient by using automatic differentiation. And then you can tune the parameters imperatively. And when you want to actually use the model to predict things, uh, you do the same. You run the computation graph by some input, and then you can get the output on the other end of the data flow graph. And we actually have designed uh, a language, what we call idealized TensorFlow, by using the diagrammatic semantics. But I'm not going to talk about the details uh, here. So if you're interested, you can check out the two papers that we wrote. So the first one is going to be the, uh, the, uh, the technical details, like the calculus and the semantics and some theoretical results. And then on the second one is going to be uh, the implementation details of the language. So instead, I'm going to talk about this kind of spreadsheet programming because it would better illustrate the use of the diagrammatic semantics. So in a language like this, you can see every uh, variable as a cell. And then when you do operations on them, you can kind of create another cell and when you run these uh, five lines, you can actually get the dependency graph on the right. And in this language, obviously, you can also modify a value of a cell. And then you can also do the stabilize function, which propagate the changes through the dependency graph, like this. And then everything else are untouched. And this kind of spreadsheet programming is actually very useful in practice as well. So if you add dynamism and also memoization and more infrastructure to it, you can actually get self-existing computation. But again, that's not what I want to talk about here today. So what I want to do is actually to exploit the power of the diagrammatic semantics. So we add circular dependency into the spreadsheet programming. And in, in this language, we'll call it the synchronous data flow. So but adding uh, circular dependencies is tricky because now the stabilized function is going to go into infinite loop. So we have the dependency graph here. You can see x and m depends on each other. And when you change the value of x, m is going to be changed. C is going to be changed. And then it will change back to x as well. And you can see the infinite loop going on. So in order to allow circular dependencies, we kind of abandon the one back step uh, stabilization. So Instead, we introduce this notion of a small step uh, propagation, which in a step, you update every cell at most once. So if you think about digital circuit, the cells are like the flip-flops, -flop, flip and then uh, the step is like a clock tick in digital circuit. So here is a small example. 
So everything is in the bracket uh, cells. So we are here creating uh, two cells, X and Y. And then in the third line, we have the link operation, which actually uh, changes the dependency of a cell. So basically, the graph is, uh, is the same as before, with some extra nodes, uh, red in color. So the diamond node represents the cell creation. And then the delta node is the link function. And then the S node is just the step operation. So let's see the execution step by step. So the token goes from the bottom, and then we are evaluating the value of x. And here we created a, a node called m node, so which is essentially the cell. So on the right, you have the dependency, and then on the left, you have the current state of the cell. And then we continue the evaluation, and now we are evaluating uh, the value of y. So you can see how a computational graph is actually built from this term graph. And if you remember, we have the, uh, the kind of the box, a uh, constant boxes which will be copied. But in this case, the cells are not going to be copied. So they will be shared uh, by the rest of the program. And that's how the computational graph is preserved. And then in the next step, we have the link function. So this is just. Uh, changing the dependency of a cell. So you can see the computational graph is on the top, and you can see the circular dependencies going on. And then finally, we have the step function. So what the step function really does is just sending evaluation token on the right-hand side of every cell. So to recompute every uh, thing, and then, oops. Okay. Right. So to compute everything, and then we update the current value of the cells. And finally, we just return the value of y. So this is a full video, and uh, you can play around with the visualizer if you want as well. So so far, I have talked about how uh, the, the semantics works, but I have, haven't to, uh, told you about uh, what it is good for. So there are some use cases of this language. The first one is uh, state, uh, to program state machines for example, if you want to have an alternating signal, then this would be just the language. Uh, this would be just the program. So I'm not going to talk about this in detail. So in the second use case, we're going to have uh, signal processing in which you can build something called the finite impulse response filter. And um, so this is basically the filter. So it's a crispy uh, definition. So what it says is 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 like this. So the output signal is depends on uh, the current input signal and also some of the history of the input signal. And the length or the how long does it depends on the history depends on the order n. And um, so this is a concrete example with the order two and then every coefficients are just one over three. And then this is a kind of a comparison between what you would uh, do in a conventional style and in our language. So in conventional style, you would think of signal as a list, and then you would do operations on the list. But in our language, we kind of don't have notion of a stream or, or a list or a signal. So we kind of just create the cells, and then we plug in other gates in order to get the output signal. And I am not going to show the example. And right. And the other use cases would probably be neural network. So I put the question mark there because this is still a work in progress. And in neural network, you can uh, think of every perceptrons or neurons as a cell in our language. Then when you do the feed forward process, you can kind of push the data down one layer by layer in order to maybe increase the throughput of the process. But, uh, and also, we also support uh, circular dependencies, which means that things like recurrent neural network can also be modeled in our language. 
But then I put a question mark on it because we haven't figured out how to do things like uh, differentiation or calculating the gradient and stuff. So, so much for the use cases, and I'm going to talk about some closely related program programming paradigm. So at the beginning, I've talked about things that uh, uh, self-adjusting computation, which allows you to uh, build incremental versions of algorithm. So a typical use case is like a sorting algorithm. Imagine that you have a list on top, and then by, use, by doing the sorting algorithm, you will get a sorted list at the bottom. And whenever you change this, or you, in, uh, you add or you delete something in the original list, the, uh, the resulting list will also be changed automatically. But the changes doesn't require you to recompute everything from scratch. So the changes will be small. <coughs> so that's why it is incremental. So in our language, it's not incremental at all, because we are, uh, we are uh, recomputing every cell uh, at every step. But then it is not difficult to imagine how we can incrementalize it. But whether we can do recursive structures or recursive algorithms is another matter. And another very closely, closely related paradigm is functional reactive programming. So naively speaking, FRP is like programming with stream. And you kind of, for example, you can have this kind of map function uh, for you to create a signal from another signal. But as I said before, in our language, we, we don't have notion of a stream. We simply have cells, and then we simply do operations on these cells. So in conclusion, what I really want to say is that we think the diagrammatic semantics is more intuitive. You can really see what the program does. And the semantics is formal, which means that you can really do proofs and cost analysis on it. And Perhaps we can also do a visual debugger using the semantics. So all in all, we think that the diagrammatic semantics is cool, and I hope you will like it. Thank you.